Well, it's a delight to be with each one of you this morning, and uh, good grief, what a joy it is to be on this campus, a place where the joy of the Lord is so, just so very evident. I bring you greetings from Kansas City, uh, where the Lord is doing a great work. Uh, there are times when you, by faith, believe the Lord is working. There are times when you, with your eyes, see the Lord working in miraculous ways. Of course, I'm referring to the Chiefs. Uh, for those of you watching the game Sunday night, and uh, we, we are all diehard Chiefs fans in our family, in our city, on our campus, and uh, it's, it's pretty exhilarating days these days. But we're here to talk about more serious things. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're looking together at Revelation chapter 3. I'm honored to get to join the sermon series in chapel this semester. I'm honored to be here for Great Commission Week. And uh, brothers and sisters, delight to hear your testimony and be able to worship with the Samaritan community through song as well. Revelation chapter 3, we're thinking together about when God opens a door. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 14, when God opens a door. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, say this i know your deeds behold i have put before you an open door which no man can shut because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name behold i will cause those of the synagogue of satan who say that they are jews but are not but lie i will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that i have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the world, to test those who dwell on the earth. For I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, we bow in this moment of worship. And Father, we have sang a couple of spectacular songs to your son. We've heard a testimony from the field. And now we've come to that point in the service when we desire to hear you speak from your word. And Father, I pray now in this moment, you would be pleased to do just that. We see in this passage this morning, this letter to the sixth church, the church at Philadelphia, this beautiful biblical metaphor that is found here and in other places in scripture, and that is of the door or a door being open and a door being shut for ministry or missionary service of ministry possibility. And we know doors, do we not? It's a metaphor that doesn't strain the imagination. Doors are common to everyday life. We are accustomed to them. We are dependent upon them. They provide us an essential service, do they not? Shut doors keep out the weather. Keep out burglars, perhaps. Keep at bay unwanted visitors. Closed doors give us privacy, solitude. Locked doors can keep people in. They can keep kids in or kids out. When I was a kid, my parents would often lock the door on summer days to keep me from running in and out of the house and leaving, letting the air conditioning go with me. Open doors let people in. They enable thoroughfare. They communicate receptivity and openness. There's a utility to these doors we see. But doors are also a rich biblical metaphor. Paul would say things like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8 and 9. I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. 2 Corinthians 2.12, he would say, I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord. Colossians 4, 2 through 3, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it, with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word so that we may proclaim the ministry of Christ. So it's a, a clear, common, biblical metaphor for ministry opportunity. 
It's spelled out in this passage. It's a metaphor I want to bring to bear in our lives this morning as we think about what open doors God has for us, for you in the room today. Now, we find ourselves in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, again, a series you guys are going through this semester, and and we know broadly what's taking place, don't we? John the Apostle is in exile on this Isle of Patmos. The year is about A.D. 90. The Apostle is aged, he's alone, but he is in the Spirit worshiping on the Lord's day. Chapter 1, verse 10 tells us that. And then chapter 1 tells us he hears a voice a voice he has not heard in a, in a half century or more. And he looks up, and before him is our resurrected, glorified Lord in all of his blazing splendor. And he's stricken with fear in that moment, and he, he falls to the ground like a dead man. Our Lord then affirms him and begins to unfold him for the, the apocalypse, this great unveiling of what will come, what is to come. And the book itself, as you read through it, there are places, perhaps many places, that are difficult to interpret, but knowing its basic structure is pretty simple. Chapter 1, verse 19, Jesus tells John, therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. That's what's happened. What he has seen is chapter 1, this vision, and chapter 2, and chapters 2 and 3, the things which are, and then chapters 4 through 22, the things which will take place after these things. And so we find ourselves in chapters 2 and 3, where Jesus is delivering seven letters, seven messages to seven real, literal churches. They were findable on a map then. They are findable on a map now. And so this sixth letter is to this church in the city in Philadelphia. We know Philadelphia a bit about it. It was a a smaller city compared to the other six. In fact, much smaller compared to to Ephesus or Smyrna. Strategically located, a, a major crossroad for those traveling to the east perched on a hilltop, thus easy to defend, and and it had a a bustling economy of trade and commerce taking place as it's there on that thoroughfare. But the city had a a fatal flaw. It was seated on a geographical fault line. And in AD 17, an earthquake struck the city, leveling the city, and then the city would know subsequent aftershocks for years to come. But in this city... Paul, we believe, planted a church while he was in Ephesus. And it is not a coincidence that we see this emphasis on key cities, churches being planted in the New Testament, because from those cities, the gospel can go forth as people come and go throughout those hubs. In fact, we know that's just what happened in this church and in the city. The gospel took root. And there maintained a vibrant Christian witness there for centuries all the way down through the 14th century in the face of persecution, Muslim conquest. This church was there, and this church was strong. Now, look with me in the passage more specifically. Notice verse 7, and and what we're going to do, we're just going to walk through these verses. I'm going to explain them as we go along, and then at the end of them, I want to make a few observations about the text and, and a few final words of application for us from a ministry standpoint. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? The angel is the, the, the one who is in spiritual leadership at this church. So perhaps the, who we might think of as the teaching pastor, the one who's giving overall leadership to this congregation. And Jesus then, in verse 7, tells John how to describe himself to these believers. And he does so typically in these different messages to the church. He, he, he emphasizes his own, his own uh, depiction as John makes in chapter 1. But here he describes himself differently or additionally than we see as, as conveyed in chapter 1. He says, he who is holy, he who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this. So Jesus, in each one of these letters, he describes himself in a way that's particularly relevant to those believers. Dr. Aiken, I am right now coaching my son's junior high boys basketball team. Seventh and eighth grade boys, which is like the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. 
Uh, I am having so much fun with this, and we are not in danger of taking this insufficiently serious, Dr. Aiken. I mean, we are all in. We, we are we're up late at night. We're going over plays. We're, we're reviewing every game. And my son, my son walks into uh, my, our bedroom about three times uh, in the evening to talk about the season, and it's just, he just never stops talking about it, except about a month ago he had a bad game, and he walked in. I started talking about it. He said, Daddy, I, I, do, I do not want to talk about basketball tonight. Well, I'm coaching him and these other seventh and eighth grade boys, and uh, you learn something about these boys as you're coaching, and different boys respond in different ways to motivation. And, and some boys need to be affirmed, and, and just they need to say, they need to hear attaboys. Other boys need to, be, need to be challenged to play harder, and then there's some boys that you have to really, really light up to get them to perform. And, uh, and we had a game a few weeks ago, and one particular boy did not show up mentally, emotionally, and he was just going through the motions, and we lost that game, and it was so frustrating. And boy, I, I really got into him at the end of that game. Not inappropriately, not in a non-Christ-like way, but, uh, but in, a, in a way that was, will no doubt be a memorable conversation for him for the rest of his life. Well, the next game we played, he showed up, and he was like running through walls. I mean, he, he was ready to go. And a coach knows his players and knows how to motivate those players in a customized way. Jesus, as he reveals himself to each church, is doing so in a customized way based upon their needs, their status, and their ministry moment. So what does he say to this church in Philadelphia? He who is holy. He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. Jesus says, I'm, I'm pure. I, I'm unblemished. I don't sin. I can't sin. He's holy in his essence. He's holy in his acts. Everything about him is holy. And he says, I am, I am true. He doesn't just speak the truth. He is the truth. And he's saying, therefore, that we can trust him. We can follow him. He is more trustworthy than any other being in the cosmos. And we can depend on him. And he says, I have the key of David, which is a statement of sovereignty, of control. And I open and no one can shut. And if shut, no one can open. It's a picture of divine sovereignty, and it's allusion to, to, I believe, to Isaiah 22, where we see when King Hezekiah is ruling over the, the Davidic kingdom, and his, his royal treasurer, Eliakim, perhaps a type himself, held the keys to the treasury, and Eliakim alone possessed these keys, and he alone could lock and unlock, and his decision was final. And so Jesus is saying to this church and through this church to us today that I stand before you as one who is holy and who is true and who is, who is sovereign. And I have the keys to open and shut doors, doors of ministry opportunity for this church, for your church, for your life, and for your ministry. And oh, by the way, my acts are final no one can shut if I have opened. No one can open if I have shut. Well, notice verse 8. He says, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut. Notice in verse 8, Jesus doesn't do the typical thing here, which he does in five of the seven letters, and bring a word of correction. Evidently, this church is healthy. In fact, we, we see that in verse 8. He's about to compliment this church and unpack their strengths, their virtues. They're, they're healthy. I, I, I know your deeds. Nothing there that, that I should correct or admonish you over. I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Why? Middle of verse 8. Because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, little power is not an insult. Jesus saying Philadelphia is a smaller city, perhaps this is a smaller church. You have a little power there. This church is evidencing spiritual power in the cause of Christ. You have power. You have kept my word. There has been a faithfulness to the command of Christ, and you have not denied my name. Thus, 
I've placed before you an open door. There does seem to be a a, a causal nature to this in these verses as we read them, does it not? Jesus is looking. Jesus is assessing. He sees them. They've been faithful in a little. And he's placed before them an opening for something greater in his service. I preached our own convocation two days ago in Kansas City. And uh, from Matthew 25, we're doing a series on the parables this semester, the parables of, uh, of the talents. And, 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 and was struck as I studied those verses and preached those verses Tuesday about, about how clearly as we were waiting for the Lord's return and in that passage as we read it, as we, as we study it, we, we do see this customized stewardship that we are given based upon the gifting God has given us, whether it's the five, the two, or the one. And we are held responsible for those gifts and to, are to leverage those gifts in a way that honor Christ and strengthen his church and expand his kingdom. There is a stewardship component to leadership, spiritually speaking, and we see that in these verses Two, they have followed my word. They have not denied my name. They have little power. One of my goals in life as a father, as a husband, as a Christian, as a minister, as a steward at Midwestern Seminary is to live my life in a way that that God would find me easy to bless. We talk at Midwestern Seminary about being the type of institution from our heart and our convictions and our, and our mission, being the type of institution that serves in such a way that God finds us blessable. He, he delights in blessing us. And we get a sense from these verses here that, that the Lord is delighting to bless them with this open door, this open door of service based upon their prior faithfulness to his word, faithfulness to his name. There's an open door before them. Some of you in the room this morning are wondering, will the Lord ever open a door for me? Some of you in the room this morning as students are wondering, what door will God open next semester, next year, after I get that degree, after I complete my studies? Some of you in the room this morning are wondering right now there's an opportunity before you and you're wondering is that the open door God wants me to step through I was struck by uh, the open door language just not too long ago I found myself in a church setting and um, there was I was being a part of a, a guest in like a large chapel class that was being taught and they were taking prayer requests and I was listening to prayer requests being taken and uh, a, a lady there was talking about wanting prayer because she was trying to, to get to the mission field. And it sounded good. I perked up and, and wanted to hear what the, what the challenges were. And, and the more she was describing it, she was talking about how that she wanted to go to work with a water purification company, which obviously sounds noble. And, um, but, but, but every she keeps running into roadblocks, roadblocks, roadblocks. And, um, and then she got talking about how, how, how they needed the money, didn't have the money to go. And, and then she, she got talking about where it was a, a dangerous place. And, and then she said, and, and pray for me while I'm there because I'd be away from my husband and my kids for a few months. And I'm hearing all this thinking, you might be getting roadblocks because this might not be an open door from the Lord. So circumstantially, it's appropriate to look at what God has brought into your life. And to barrage that with biblical wisdom and seeking wise counsel and circumstantially, is the Lord opening a door there or not? Open doors of ministry should first be opened by God himself. Secondly, they often require a step of faith. Following the Lord's will in ministry, whether it's to attend a seminary or to pastor a church or go to the mission field, whatever God is calling you to do, it most always requires a step of faith. I tell prospective students, if if you wait till every logistical loose end is perfectly tidied up to attend seminary, you'll never attend seminary. It's like the couple that says, we're going to wait till everything is tidied up before we start a family, then you'll never start a family. Because there will always be loose ends in your life, logistically and otherwise. Following God's will into your life, whether it's to have a family or go to seminary or serve a church, there is always a step of faith that comes into play. 
Is there an open door before you that the Lord has placed there? Are you praying about that? Are you sensitive to that? Are you seeking that? Sometimes open doors are so wide and so obvious that they are absolutely unmissable. I was um, on an airplane a number of years back, and I was to board a plane from Cincinnati to fly to Los Angeles. And I was there, and the, the flight got delayed, and the flight got delayed, and the flight got delayed. And like, I, I, don't do, I don't do delays well. I'm a pretty impatient guy by nature. I, I will sometimes go right at a red light, even if I need to go left, just so I can keep moving. I'm one of those kind of guys, okay? And we're there, delay, delay, delay. I'm trying to not be pouty, have a bad attitude. Well, uh, at last, they invite us to board the flight. We go and sit down. And I, I situate myself there, folding into the, to the seat, and there's a lady beside me there, and I'm, I'm kind of complaining about the delayed flight. And she says to me, she says, I never complain about delayed flights. I said, you don't? Well, that's interesting. You know, why not? And she said, because as a teenage girl, I was scheduled to be on Pan Am Flight 103 that blew up over Lockerbie, Scotland. Well, I'm like bug-eyed hearing her say that. I said, you're, you're kidding me, right? She said, no. And she was dead serious in her voice. I said, you're a teenager. Were you there with your family? She said, no, I was with a Baptist youth group on a mission trip. And she said, we were all scheduled to fly back, and our tr group was delayed. And I said, a Baptist group? I said, are you, are you a Baptist? She said, oh, no, I'm not a Baptist. I was just, it was like one of these youth group things I got to be a part of. And I said, are you a Christian? And she said, I'm, real, I'm really not a Christian either. And they said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a Baptist pastor. <laughs> and she, she got bug-eyed back at me. And she said, are you serious? There was a little cracking in her voice. And, um, and she said, and I could tell there was an openness there. And I said to her, I said, ma'am, God may have had you miss a flight decades ago to save your life. But this your connection to be seated by me today to save your soul. And she began to cry, and there was an open door there wide enough to drive a truck through. And from Cincy to L.A., we talked, and between Cincy and L.A., I believe that lady was born again. The point is not that I'm Billy Graham on an airplane. The point is that our Lord opens doors. And we have to perceive those and be willing to take a step of faith and walk through those. And on the front end, we need to indeed pray for those. Ask the Lord to open doors of ministry for us. Now look with me back in verse 9. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. What in the world is going on here? Well, evidently, these are Jews who are culturally, ethnically, ceremonially Jewish, but in that they have not believed in Christ as the Messiah, Jesus as the Messiah. They are not spiritually reborn, thus not spiritually spiritual Jews. And so Jesus refers to them here as, as not true followers, thus a part of a, a synagogue of, of Satan, because they're part of what clearly false religion. They say they're Jews, they are not. And Jesus says, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Now, now, when and how that was or will be fulfilled, we simply don't know. But the picture is that is clear is that the gospel of Christ triumphs. God's people will triumph. And whether in earth through conversion and through the work of the Spirit, where people see and believe the gospel and embrace the gospel and, and submit to Jesus or through final judgment when they will see and perceive that Jesus is on the throne and is indeed the Son of God, one way or the other or somewhere in between, that recognition will take place. Jesus is saying that recognition will take place. And so Jesus makes this promise, and then notice verse 10. Because you have kept my word of perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing. I will keep you from the, from the hour of testing, that which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who live on earth. Now, 
we have to ask ourselves what's going on here. And basically there are one of, one of two options, one, one of two um, conclusions to draw. That this is a, a reference to the coming tribulation, the coming punishment and judgment over this earth. And Christ is saying, I will, I will preserve you from that or, or remove you from that. And so some, some of us look at this passage and see this as a reference to a pre-tribulational rapture. Others look at this and, and see this as God's sustaining grace of believers, preserving them through that hour of testing, through that coming tribulation, and enable them to endure through that and not deny the name of Christ. So is this a promise that the church will be held up, protected during the great tribulation? Is it a promise that the church will be removed, raptured before the season of cataclysm? The point here, I believe, overarching seems to be that Christ is with his true church. And that is a point that we cling to this morning. That when we watch the news, when we view our politics, when we sense cultural marginalization, when we face absolute persecution, when we see the nations rage around us, we cling to the promise that Christ is with his church, that Christ is with us, that he reigns over all and that we will reign with him over all. It says in verse 11, see, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast that which you have so that no one will take away your crown. In other words, demonstrate that you are indeed my children by holding fast to my gospel, my word. Then he says in verse 12, he who, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name, a picture of the saints worshiping and reigning and dwelling with him forever in heaven. That is their promise. That is our hope as well. Three observations about these verses and then a few words of application. Observation number one, Christ loves the church. The New Testament, after all, is what? It's the story of the church. First, the story of Christ coming and dying for his church. Then the conclusion of the Gospels, the beginning of Acts, these, these five great commissions to do what? To go make believers and baptize them into the church. The book of Acts, chapter 2, Pentecost, the church's birth. And then the story of Acts is the church metastasizing throughout the Mediterranean region. And these mission trips taking place and the gospel being preached. And, and then what? We get to the epistles. And what do we see there? It's all about the church. What the church is to believe, how the church is to function, how it is to be governed, how it is to, to minister. And then we get to the book of Revelation. What do we see? It's about the church. Seven letters to seven real churches. And then this, this unfolding for the church of all that will happen at the end of the age. Brothers and sisters, observation number one is Christ loves the church. He loves this church. He loves your church. He loves the church. Observation number two, faithfulness is rewarded. Matthew chapter 25, as I've already mentioned, is a supplemental passage that comes to mind as we think of these verses. But Christ here is speaking concretely to these believers about the fact that since they have been faithful, a greater door of ministry service is before them, is before them. And it's there for them to walk through it. I say to you this morning, don't strive for success in your life. I promise you I don't. I have many, many, many spiritual shortcomings. But I do understand by God's grace that faithfulness in ministry is to be valued far above success in ministry. It's even to be valued over fruitfulness in ministry. Faithfulness is rewarded. Observation number three, there is a contingency to ministry opportunities for you for your church, for the Southern Baptist Convention. We see that here, don't we? Jesus is saying, because of this, because of this, I will open this door. I will enable this. So for you, be the type of man, the type of woman that is so faithful to Christ that he finds you eminently blessable with greater doors of ministry opportunity. For your church to be faithful to the Word of God and the Gospel such that God finds your church 
eminently blessable and for the southern baptist convention for us collectively brothers and sisters may god do a new work in our lives to our commitment to the word and the gospel and to the great commission are so palpable that he'll be pleased in our generation to open new doors of ministry and mission opportunity for us those are the observations now a couple of final words of application for you number one I think when it comes to doors of ministry, it seems to me that people tend to err in one of two ways. One is those who go about their ministries with a touch of hyperactivity, wondering and worrying what they will do next, where God will have them next. And, and, and all of life becomes a subtle form of ministerial self-promotion, social media channels, all that is to communicate what's taking place, and perhaps this is done subconsciously, unconsciously, unwittingly, but, but there is an, a, a level of activity for personal ministerial promotion that dishonors the Lord. Let me encourage you this morning. God knows your name. He knows your phone number. He knows your email address. He knows how he's gifted you. He knows what he has before you. He can find you. He will find you. He can use you. He will use you. Be available for his service, but don't be hyperactive about achieving it. I think about when I began a ministry 25 years ago, roughly, how much the world has changed. I'm still a pretty young guy. God called me to ministry in college. We didn't have a cell phone, didn't have an email address, didn't have a website. Yes, those things existed, but I didn't have one or any of those. We didn't have, we didn't have social media. I didn't have a resume because I was uncomfortable with a resume and should or I shouldn't have in ministry. And, but every step of the way, the Lord has opened doors, did open doors for service. He knew where I was. He found me. I say to you this morning, don't be hyperactive, erring in that way of ministerial self-promotion. Don't do it. Be content to be like Jesse's youngest son, minding the sheep. He knows where you are. The other extreme are, are those that are, that are, that are just passive, and before you right now, the Lord has already placed an open door of ministry. And it's there for you, and you need to, by faith, walk through it. It may soon close. Walk through that open door if it is of the Lord. How might I know? Biblical wisdom, spiritual common sense, wise counsel by older brothers, circumstantial realities can be informative as well. But if God has called you to serve him, and he has before you an opportunity of service to serve, it's probably not a great step of faith to conclude that that, that is the door he has opened for you right now. And understand, walking through that door doesn't lead you into a room that you never go out of. It may well lead you from one door to the next, to the next, to the next. Final word of application. This is Great Commission Week here. And I want to say to you guys here, I love you. I love your mission. I love to be challenged by those two letters, go. And I just encourage you, continue to hold that high. That so God has given you not only a, a ministerial important voice in this regard, but for our denomination and beyond, he's given you a needed and prophetic voice. Continue to herald that vision. And as you call yourselves and the student body and the churches around and people like me and our entire denomination to go, continue to do so and the lord surely will be continue pleased to continue to bless you as you do let us pray father we come to you this morning and we rejoice in these verses and father we believe that you are indeed a sovereign lord that your son is working that he indeed is opening and shutting doors and father help us by faith to see that to believe that and to act accordingly because of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.